ADHD Rewired, episode 472. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Ian Siegel. Ian has been doing test prep and college consulting for a decade. In that time, he's delivered some of the highest improvements on the SAT and ACT in the country and has helped over 90% of the students he worked with get into their top choice colleges. He is the author of School Sucks, Your Child Doesn't, The Secret to Unlocking Your Child's Untapped Potential, what a great title, Um, where he details his philosophy and illustrates the overlooked reality that every leader, thinker, and uh, doer has had an expert tutor or mentor. Ian, welcome to the podcast. Eric, thanks so much for having me. We're going to talk about learning as adult learners and why... Some of the smartest people happen to also be some of the worst learners. <laughs> yes, exactly. I know. I know this is kind of. A, I, I want to. I want to frame it in a more positive light. I think that maybe another way of saying it is that brilliance comes with baggage, and I think that people aren't. I think in this society where we're all about outputs and and getting things done and all of that, we kind of overlook the reality that we really need to treat ourselves according to who we are. And if you're a sensitive person and you are broadly sensitive to your environment in all types of ways, then things that are stressful can really impede your kind of learning state. It kind of has these like implications that are just beyond even the moment of being distracted. It's kind of what I've noticed working with students, but then I turn it around and see it in everyone. But it is just that there's these kind of personalities that are created around these cognitive realities at a kind of almost formulaic level. And what I, my hope is to, what I try to do with my students and, you know, my employees and myself is to get us out of those kind of negative self-talk. And, and I'm not, I don't even mean, sorry, it's a negative cycle, but it's not necessarily negative self-talk all the, all the time. It's a specific kind of narrative that we tell ourselves that often kind of just goes with a cognitive reality. So What I notice is that like, because I end up, and this happens with a lot of tutors who really experience, is that you end up working with some of the brightest. And those bright kids have bright parents too. And all of them, it's a different set of skills and challenges that you're encountering when you're working with these students. And they're largely emotional. And those become the learning disabilities that I notice the most that are like the kind of the most challenging. And I would say the most problematic, one is anxiety. Two is ADHD. And then three is actually depression is actually like not as bad in some ways, as long as the depression doesn't get too, get too bad. But that just systematically watching parents and students and my employees and who can learn, it's really kind of understanding. And that's why I appreciate about your podcast so much is the kind of the self-knowledge that, that you, you guys celebrate. It's so important as a starting point to actually learn at your pace as a learner. So, so did you get into this work um, through kind of your own kind of learning journey? Yeah, I, it, definitely. I think, well, one thing that I was joking around with one of my uh, tutors yesterday was that I was like, you know how psychologists and therapists, they, you know, they end up doing that because they want to heal themselves. They, they're like, they, them themselves, they need it. They need the therapy. And I'm like looking at all these teachers and tutors and I'm like, you guys suck at learning. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's why you're here to learn to learn again. You're not knowing it consciously, but on a subconscious level. And I'm like, because I'm like trying to like help these tutors change behaviors, integrate what they learn. And it is like, oh, 
I mean, yes, intuitive. And they have this like incredible bandwidth starting out in life, right? You know, and how much, how quick they're able to pick things up. But then they hit that wall, you know, that wall that a lot of people hit a lot earlier in life, you know, a learning experience. And they're like, oh, my, what is this? Holy, you know, like, and they, and then there's defense mechanism, defense mechanism, defense mechanism. And I saw, I say all that because I'm like the guiltiest one. I know because through my own experience, so I grew up in DC. I went to this very challenging all boys school called St. Anselm's. No one's heard of it. It's just, it's highest average of AP scores of any school school in the DC area. All complete nerds. I Sounds was on- like an anxiety, just like cesspool. <laughs> so you you think that, but the fact that everybody was no girls, extremely nerdy, and kind of this, I don't know. There was there was that it was less than it was it wasn't the normal thing. It actually, it was very unusual. So I was really lucky to have this experience, and it was an incredible school, you know. And you think I, but but I was ADHD out the wazoo this whole time not really kind of pushing myself beyond what I was capable of, you know, and not really recognizing that my, about myself. But I'm like, you know, smart enough that I'm keep getting by with A's, end up at Vanderbilt, and then, you know, continuing on to like work tutor in uh, Silicon Valley for this hyped up, very fancy education consulting company, which is just a tutoring company and college counseling stuff, but education consulting because it's Silicon Valley clients. And the whole time, I just sucked as a learner. Like I'm not really actively seeking out the unknown. I'm like just judging myself about what I already know. And this is the, I talk about this in my book. So I end up being a, you know, one of the highest, you know, higher build at first kind of reading and writing tutors on the SAT and everything. And then also kind of like other admissions tests and then kind of building up to that because I was that guy. That's why I did a band about very, very good at math and reading both. No problem. But I just decided, you know, I went that direction. Anyway, end up being matched with this seven-year-old Chinese kid who's a genius, basically. So I didn't really believe it going into it, but, you know, his dad saying, no, like, you know, I have an IQ of this. I went to Harvard. I, you know, summa cum laude. I mean, saying all this stuff, which I'm like, first of all, EQ wise, I'm like, I don't know about (laughs) (laughs) someone who would just say all that stuff. But, but, but so like doubting, because, you know, I have a little bit more EQ than that. And I'm kind of realizing, okay, autism spectrum, something's going on here. But when I'm introduced to this kid, um, let's call him Chen, he uh, he's everything that his dad said and and more. Like, I mean, if you've ever seen Goodwill Hunting, you know, that scene where, where um, J- oh, what's his name? Uh, the actor Jason Bourne, Bourne, <laughs> Bourne um, me, uh, Matt, Matt Damon. Matt Damon. Uh, yeah, Matt Damon, thank you. Anyway, I'm matched with Chen and, you know, I'm a, I'm a newer tutor, newer coach, right? And I'm like, you know, very puffing up my chest about, oh, I was a, you know, literature major and, and at Vanderbilt being the, on the lowest, to, you know, pull of the totem pole in the sense that the, the lowest part of the totem pole in the sense that like all the other tutors went to Stanford. So I'm like oh, in, in the Silicon Valley hyper competitive way. Oh, it's just a Vanderbilt tutor. So I had to really like carry my own and all that stuff. So this kid is just, okay, he's seven years old. He's reading a book that's on the on an eighth grade level. His English is his second language. And I mean, flying anytime he didn't know a word. He looked it up immediately in his Kindle. He logged it in his brain, like, like without question. I'd never see kids do this, <laughs> never. And, and it just became part of them. And, and I asked him about the words later and he always knew them and he was using them in the future, like, like, like that. And I was like, oh my God, you know, and I, I was so like, oh my God, I can't believe this. The pace that he's just like learning. And I'm like, I'm barely helping. I'm just like watching this kid do something amazing. So we switched gears to doing, um, New York Times, like op-ed stuff. So we would, we'd read, because it's challenging to find something that is challenging for this kid, but also not inappropriate at the same time. He's seven years oh, old. Oh, it's so, they, with my, my, my son, who's, he's on the spectrum, he's ADHD and he's highly gifted. And he, like, he, he was reading at one years old, like his, oh, his God. asynchronous development where he could read the pages, but he, his fine motor was so poor, he couldn't turn the pages. Wow. Wow. I mean, see, this, that's, See, your son's another great example. It's just like, these kids are incredible. I mean, and I, that's the, that's the thing. And like, I mean, this is part of the, the kind of the takeaway of the story. It's like learning from tutoring. I mean, like you just see someone else's brain and you're like, wow. Because he starts reading these books and I, you know, and I, I, I'll sometimes take a little bit of a look at what he's reading. And occasionally I'm like, buddy, like, this is (laughs) not appropriate. Like, (laughs) I was like, oh man, he's, he's been reading this thing. It's called, um. SPC, I think it's called. It's like this weird, like sci-fi, basically manual 
of like wow. all these obscure items that have like and his books like it's he has it on the Kindle, but it's like thousands of pages, and like wow. all the stuff is like it doesn't make really any sense to me. I'm like, what's the, I don't get the point of this, but he loves it because <laughs> uh, it all has like a number to it, and he loves numbers. I think it was my uh, my niece who's actually uh, was over, and my son was showing it to her, and then he goes, she goes. Uncle Eric, you might want to actually um, look at what he's reading. And I was like, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah, we're not going to be reading this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough show. I mean, it's tough. And those kids are tough to, to find the right thing for them because you want to keep them engaged. And then you don't want to open their, I mean, like two, I mean, come right. on. That's, that's a lot there. So oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, and it's crazy how there's a lot of kids, there are a lot of kids like that in Silicon Valley. I mean, I was just off the top of my head, I was thinking of another kid who's just like hyperlexia, like, like, you know, Mm -hmm. just reading like constantly. And also the ability to just like rattle back the book word for word verbatim. I'm like, okay, you know, you know, I, I started to have some like gather the humility that started to help me become a better learner. But the kicker was this, we were, we were going back and forth while we were taking sides about there happened to be a very kind of uh, an accessible article, at least for him. I thought it was kind of strange because he's like his cultural context is, you know, Shanghai. But he was like picking up that we were reading this uh, argument about this debate between two writers around should homeschool students be able to play on sports teams for their local public high school. I mean, he was like intuiting, you know, like the the context, this is social context and not even, you know, just the like the actual words on the page. And I, I felt like he was beating me in the argument, you know, and but the, but the thing that was I along the way, there was a word and I don't know if it was this article or another one, but it was flank. And unlike Chen, spent my life not looking up words, relying on context clues, focusing on, OK, I pretty much got this. So like I flank, I, I you know, gathered from like Braveheart, you know, I thought of like a flank attack. I thought it was from behind, but from the side. So Chin, genius Chin's genius father walks by, hears me say flank is from behind. And I, that look that he cast over his shoulder, I, and, and he says, Chin, flank is from the side. <laughs> <laughs> the session ended quickly, you know, not, not quickly thereafter, but, you know, they started to kind of back up and our tutoring sessions became increasingly inconvenient. And I started, it started to dawn on me kind of like what had happened because like at, at, at first I was like very defensive. I was thinking, oh, like, well, these, you know, these, this, 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 or someone's on the autis- autism spectrum. They don't really understand that like this is okay and all that. But the reality is it was a tip of an iceberg moment. Mm. At that moment, he knew I couldn't help his son because I hadn't been like the learner that I could have been. And so I I wasn't really modeling anything great for his kid, who was an incredible learner at age seven. And honestly, it's like the thing is like, that's not such a big deal. Kids start off as incredible learners. And I just saw noticed that like what this kid had was this kind of like that circular process of learning of integrate, seeing, reconciling, integrating, and then that integration expanding the radius with which he saw the world. And I was realizing, shit, I haven't been doing that at all. (laughs) Like hardly at all. And I think like the interesting thing is that he's able to do that. And he's on the autism spectrum, which I think is a, you know, that's a serious learning disability because the reality is if you have the EQ and the IQ, that should be like a superpower. But what I see instead is the EQ becomes a disability because you start worrying about this social stuff of everything. This kid's not worrying about anything. He's like, let me learn. And I'm sure your son may be like more along those lines, but the reality is the people who have the most EQ are the ones who have the best capacity to think from other people's perspectives. And just in case people aren't familiar with EQ, it's it's emotional intelligence. uh, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Emotional intelligence. Absolutely. And the emotional quotient or whatever. Yeah. And, And I think that like, that's the kicker for so many people is that like, we're not realizing we're putting in all these strategies and all this stuff. But like the idea is that like reality is from like comes from an intersection of different perceptual sources. Like you're integrating that. So I, I, I'd love to d- dig into this a little bit deeper, but it's uh, yeah, some let's, exciting let's take, stuff. Yeah. Let's take a quick break. And, uh, and when we come back, um, I, I'm looking forward to kind of getting into especially the, the mind of the um, you know bright, even gifted adult learner and how sometimes the giftedness can make learning a real challenge. So we will be 
right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our award-winning, intensive online coaching and accountability groups. And support on your ADHD journey can start at coachingrewired.com. Our 32nd season of coaching groups is just around the corner and there is still time for you to join. That's coachingrewired.com to check out the schedules for our five sections that are available for our upcoming spring season. And to get started on your pre-registration process to join us for our next registration event, this week on Thursday, March 9th at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. If you're done with feelings of overwhelm and ready to get unstuck, want to set better boundaries, learn ADHD-friendly ways to gain momentum on your biggest goals, and are willing to participate and put in the work while engaging alongside other like-minded brains who just get it, then this is the group that you've been looking for. Whether you're new to ADHD Rewired or you've been a longtime listener and are on the fence about your decision to join us, here's what some listeners like you shared with us after being a part of our coaching groups. I decided to join the group both as like a proxy to kind of move forward in my professional transition as well as try a different approach to productivity and whatnot. I decided to join this group because I was diagnosed really late at 39 and mostly just to learn more about ADHD is a initial learning resource. I felt like I had hit sort of a low. I was really not thriving at work sufficiently, although I was taking on more and more responsibility and uh, was really burning myself out. It's so mind-boggling to me that I feel like we're all let in on a secret that no one else seems to know or to think about. It may just happen to them naturally, like planning or executive function or whatever, but to me, just like having that and carrying that around like makes me feel not only motivated, but that even though you may struggle, you can tackle anything and do hard things. I learned a lot of the things I do in my life are coping mechanisms, and there are better ways to get around it with Medication was super helpful, but just being able to talk to my peers and find out like, oh, these are also problems that other people have and it's not just me being lazy or unmotivated has been incredibly helpful to the point where my team has, we've already got plans for meeting regularly what we're into the future. Moments that were most meaningful were hearing the other group members' stories and realizing that my own life stories are different, but the same in so many ways. We're all struggling with the same things and that's what makes it so powerful to know that other people are feeling the same things and seeing the same things that the rest of humankind pretends that they're not experiencing or seeing or doesn't. It was one of the best decisions I've ever made to take this course. I've always thought of lists and calendar planning as really just mapping out other people's urgencies and therefore I'm not, it, it's just so hard to do. The big flip for me was when I realized that those things are about me building a great life for myself to ensure that I maintain the pillars that support my nervous system. And also as a way to see in that planning that I'm building in time for the things that really matter to me that help me stay grounded. Something that I did not expect was just immediately recognizing myself in a lot of, it literally feels like you're staring in a mirror like for 10 weeks but in a good way. So I did not expect the community and sort of the outreach and the connection. My biggest takeaway was we're all here learning to support our future selves. And that like still comes to the top of my mind like day to day. Just the support group around it has been a big game changer for me. Here at ADHD Rewired, we believe it's not about working harder. It's about learning what works for you and your unique ADHD brain and working smarter for you so you can live a meaningful, wholehearted, and intentional life. So if this sounds like the group that you would need to move forward with the things that are actually important to you, then take that first step by going to coachingrewired.com. Registration is by invitation only, so don't wait. Once you've gone to coachingrewired.com, click on that big purple button at the top of the page to get your name added to our spring interest list. Then once you've confirmed your email, instructions will be sent to you with what you need to complete to join us on Thursday, March 9th at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Level up your ADHD management with people who just get it and get started at coachingrewired.com. 
But don't wait, we are filling up. My section only has one spot left. Section five with Kristen Marks only has two spots left. So go check out the website, get your name added to the interest list, and we would love to see you on Thursday. And did you know, if you are in the US, PayPal offers six months, 0% interest financing to qualified applicants. So it's a great way to make this an investment on an affordable monthly budget. Come invest in your growth. Growth happens here, and you don't have to do any of this alone. That's coachingrewired.com. If you like ADHD Rewired and want to hear more ADHD stories and ADHD management strategies, then be sure to check out the other podcasts we have here on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network. We also want to thank all of our listeners who tune into this show every week. If you want to support this show, then we'd love it if you left a rating and review in your favorite podcast player, if your podcast app allows. Want to grab the resources mentioned in each show? Then go to ADHDrewired.com dot com slash podcast to find episode archives and show notes for each episode. Then if you want to get more ADHD friendly solutions to your ADHD related questions, then go to ADHDrewired.com slash events and register so you can join me and the rest of the ADHD Rewired team every second Tuesday of the month on Zoom for our monthly live Q&A. That's every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. For our next Q&A, we're going to be joined by a special guest panelist, my friend Drew Ackerman, who you might know as Scoots, who's the host of the Sleep With Me podcast. If you've never heard Sleep With Me and you're looking for a strangely wonderful podcast to help you fall asleep, check out Sleep With Me podcast. So join us on March 14th for our next live Q&A with Scoots from Sleep With Me. Whether you want to join us for our live monthly Q&A, need to find show notes to all of our episodes, or want to learn more about our adult study hall community or award-winning coaching and accountability group. You can find it all at ADHDrewired.com. That's ADHDrewired.com. All right, we are back with Ian Siegel. All right, so Ian, um, before the break, we were kind of talking about some of the the experiences you've had professionally working with uh, others and kind of uh, talking about how you saw your, your own learning journey um, and recognizing, oh, I, I had some things to learn to help these kinds of learners learn, right? Absolutely. So let's talk about adults here. So sure. one of the things that I guess bringing it back for a moment to, uh, to my son, cause when I, that's, that's where I started learning about giftedness. And, um, I think there, I think it was a book or an article that I read a while ago in that the idea that giftedness is a serious problem. <laughs> Right. And it's what it's, it has this reverse stigma of like the name, like, oh, you're gifted. Like, oh, you're, you're, you know, your kid's so gifted. You're bragging. It's like, actually, it's, I think it's actually a terrible name for what it is because it's high IQ is one part of giftedness, but it is way more than that. It's just like experiencing everything in this very intense kind of way. And one of the things that I see, um, I see this with my son, and I see this with, with other, gifted learners is that when something doesn't come to them right away, then the emotional stuff kicks in. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I, my whole life, I was used to having to struggle to learn stuff. And so I have become really good at learning how I learn. Lots of things did not come naturally to me. So let's, let's talk about this. So you got these different kinds of learners, different kinds of brains. How do we help people who have different learning styles actually learn, especially when we're dealing with all the, the years of school trauma? Yeah. No, yeah, it's definitely a blessing and a curse, giftedness. And then when it's, and it becomes, I've noticed more of a curse, the longer you're in school or you're longer in, in a place where you're feeling like you need to judge yourself and figure out like, because at the end of the day, learning happens really fast when there's this kind of unconditional acceptance towards yourself. So yeah, I think like, you know, I tell, I tell that. Wait, I want to pause on that because that's actually a really important point. So say that again. Well, learning comes when, yeah, not when you're stressed or under the gun, but when you unconditionally accept yourself. I'm just like thinking about what that means and thinking about listeners sort of integrating that idea of like when we can unconditionally accept ourselves, that's when learning happens. So let's, let's yeah. unpack that a little bit. When you're in a state of self-judgment, right, that means you are prioritizing what you already know and how you're thinking about the world around you. When you have utter self-acceptance, unconditional, 
what it does is it, it creates the kind of neurological environment when a new thing pops in to your, like a stimulus, you know, into your brain, your brain picks up on a signal. You're not in a kind of stress state where it feels like it's going to overwhelm you. You're in a kind of calm state, kind of like when you're eating food, right? You want to be in that state while learning because it's like your parasympathetic system really going by accepting yourself. You calm that the, the nervous system down. It even is true on a neurological level. And this is actually ties into COVID, which is crazy, is that when the brain is inflamed, it produces cytokines. This is like an inflammatory response. And that's healthy when you're in a kind of quiet state, because that's, it's kind of like, you know, change the neural connections here. We're good, right? But a lot of people live in a state of where there's cytokine levels, which could be a product of like, you know, stress from the outside world, internal stress, because like there's something wrong, you have diabetes or something like that, or you have a heart, heart disease, or, you know, just any kind of chronic, chronic anything. So their, their states, their, their cytokine levels like pretty high. And so any kind of learning experience becomes a reason to shut down or to block out or something. By kind of accepting yourself unconditionally, you can even change that neurochemical situation to a certain extent so that you can bring those levels down. And then you're like, you're ready for, you know, to learn. Mm. You know, it kind of makes me think about how, you know, as, as a coach and, and in terms of a therapist, we play with words a lot, right? And so, you know, when we hear uh, a client say, this is um, a problem, you know, say it's a challenge versus a problem because like a challenge is something you can do about, you know, I was thinking about this idea of when we look at a challenge and even taking that to uh, the next level and saying, oh, this is an opportunity for growth. And I think that when I first, when that idea, and I was first introduced to that uh, many years ago, I was like, oh, that's a, you know, a, a clever sort of spin on saying the same thing. Like, yep, this, uh, this, I suck at this. Okay. It's an opportunity for growth. But what I've really, over the years, as through practice and as I've grown my business, like I've had to confront a lot of things that have been challenging for me. And there yeah. have been things where I'm like, I truly don't know how I'm going to do this. There was these moments where I felt like, am I hitting a ceiling on, on something here? Like, or it just felt, and I was like, well, here's a lot of opportunities for growth here. I don't know how I'm going to learn it, but it's important enough to me that I'm going to keep poking at the, the bear of what I don't understand until I learn yeah. it. And I have found over time that that opportunity for growth idea really feels like a genuine opportunity. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I think like you're basically creating agreements with yourself. I mean, or like having these experiences over and over again. And eventually your whole, your mindset does change because like your experience of like overcoming these challenges becomes, a, it's like part of who you are. Then you're like, oh, I see myself that way. And then you don't go down the same kind of like anxious paths or kind of distracting yourself past them on purpose, you know, to procrastinate because you're scared of what that might entail. But yeah, I mean, I think it's unfair for people, coaches, because it's like, if you really kind of take advantage of it, you it's the learning experience really is like, it's yours, you know, it's unfair because like, I mean, that's that, I mean, with Chen and I've, I've done that ever since. I mean, with parents too, it's just, just talking to everyone. I'm like, oh okay, no, the world's a little different than what I thought. And then kind of reconciling that and, and rearranging and being okay with it. But I think it's kind of a tragedy too, that we're like talking about this as if this is like so different and big deal, you know, because it's like, I think in school that doesn't happen. Cause I think what you're like experiencing, what you're describing is also, it's like an intellectual experience. Like, like, see, you're seeing it some way you didn't see the problem the other way. You kind of like Honestly, like, I don't want to sound too woo-woo, but you're like developing a higher consciousness. Like Einstein says, no problem is solved in the same conscious plane that you're like, you start from, you have to go from to another level. I, again, bringing back to kids, but then I see this with adults too. It's just this, like, where are the intellectual experiences? Where is that before and after happening? It feels so much. We are so focused on memorizing what we already know as a culture and, it's a and right then judging and ourselves. Answer. Yeah, that's right or wrong answer. You know, it's like, it's it's silly. It's really silly. And, and it's just like, it's it, and if you think about it, if learning, right? Like, and that's why I like about like startups and stuff like that, because that's a, a learning situation. You don't know what's going to happen next. You're trying to like put yourself out there and then quickly just learn from that situation. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't, 
It doesn't happen that way. And it's beyond just on an individual level. It's also in the sense of like, in, in collaboration with each other, a lot of times when we're opposite, so take the anxious person and then the, the person with ADHD, they butt heads and they become, they become worse learners instead of like, like really learning from the other's perspective. See, I see this in my, my, my company, like when we were really having some troubles, um, this just like, you know, like I have someone in marketing and someone in sales and they hated each other. I mean, imagine like they got to communicate. Yeah, that's, a, that's a tough team to not have uh, on the same page. Yeah, no. And, and I, I just, so like two, two kind of archetypes that come out of like anxiety and ADHD for me are what I call control freaks and escape artists. So I had a control freak, you know, on the sales side and I had an escape artist on the marketing side. And they're just like defining themselves against each other. You're like, well, you, this person sucks. And, you know, the, the way they think about stuff is just so like bad, you know, like, like the ADHD person, you know, the, the, they're getting blamed for just like missing a detail that screws everything up. And then the control freaks getting blamed for like thinking too much in a box and all of that. So I was reading about ancient history um, in this book called Dawn of Everything. It's an incredible book. It's like really recent. Um, recently published this genius guy wrote it and then dropped dead like the week after. Oh God. <laughs> so it was, it's, it's a, it he took fin- a lot. He finishes the book of Dawn of Everything. My work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See you guys. Um, but he, th- I learned to like a, a, like a complicated sounding word from this book that I thought was just so on, on point in terms of how we're failing to learn from each other, which is, um, it's called schismogenesis. Ooh. And it's basically that we define ourselves against each other defensively. Just think of like any like rivalry throughout history, like France versus England and, all, you know, the Native American tribes did that to the nth degree. And it's just that when we're insecure, for whatever reason, you know, no self-acceptance, Suddenly we go back to like social rules and say like, yeah, you suck. I'm the guy, you know, and, and I know what's up defensively and sub- while subconsciously knowing that we're not learning and we're kind of like upset about it. Cause I think that's what we're supposed to be doing. And we're much happier when we, when we are, yeah, a lot of opportunities like, you know, in the workplace to like shift that, but the way we have to listen to each other to get past those defensive those defense things, it just requires some real time, I think, you know, to, to like get people to calm down. So what do we do about that? I know this it sounds like just right into like a sales pitch for us, but it's like, you know, a world of coaches is a lot better world. One way, one in which that when people learn things, they turn around and they teach the next person, you know, what they just learned. So they can experience what we get to experience. We, we get all the good stuff, you know, getting to like, it, and it becomes like too, like, you know, now I don't let, learn much from my students, you know, or anything, like, you know, because I've like really kind of pulled this all together, but I'm still like still trying, but it's like a 90, 10%. It was a flip to Chin's case. I was like, I learned 90%. But I think that like, there could be a more even balance if there was just like, that was part of learning as like instituted in companies. And if you look at like some of like the best, consulting companies, they have apprenticeships, basically, like, you know, my friend works at Bain, he's like kind of an apprentice of someone else. It's like, and and the thing is, it's just that that's only reserved for royalty. And not even that, you know, because like the Bain employee, right? Like, oh, we're going to invest in this guy, or this woman. You know, I, I just think that like, I have this eye for potential that people are have way more potential than they realize. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, actually, we should be doing that at a way greater rate than people even understand. I don't know if you've ever heard this. It's one of my favorite quotes. It's by uh, Henry Rollins. And it's, if you could see the you that I see when I see you, you would see yourself so differently. Oh my God. I, 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 like, I feel like I say that in different ways to my students all the time. I'm like, I'm, I feel like I'm the only one who knows your potential. You're hiding it from yourself. Your parents are like worried, you know? And that's the other thing. When, you, when you're an adult and you have kids, it's tough, man, because you have more than you, blind spots, not just yourself. It's also your kid. <laughs> and the, the, it's the sap because you're worried about them, you know, and you're worried about you and like, you want them to do the right things and you want them to be okay. And you want yourself to be okay. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just tough because that all that self-judgment does prevent learning. And in, in addition to like, like the opposite, like reality could be the case, which is 
that like, you know, our closest relationships should be our greatest sources of like learning. And I, a lot of times it is, you know, you start off, like you have a baby, you're like, holy cow, like I'm learning a ton, you know, and then your, your spouse, you're like, I mean, once you start, stop learning about your spouse, that's like, you know, separation, divorce kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah. Been there, done that. Uh, So, well, a brilliant person here. So. <laughs> you know, it, it, so much of of learning, especially if you know we're not typical learners and have neurodivergent brains, really, it, it seems like like depends on our ability to hold space for uncertainty and ambiguity, and not having any idea what the heck we're doing, and being able to stay curious in that space. Absolutely. And that's tough. I mean, because again, that self-judgment stuff starts creeping in in those situations a lot for a lot of people. But I think like one thing that could be comforting that I've I've started to think about is, I know it sounds negative, but like think about an idea that like, in my opinion, as a society, human population, we're not learning that well. So like like the, the, the conventional kind of like mainstream stuff is pretty much like indoctrination into what we already know. And you do all this stuff and you and you might be okay kind of stuff, right? Especially with the way how siloed media is now. Like you, you'll find oh, any, yeah. any, you know, channel to just echo your, you, you know, your own points of view. Yeah, exactly. So then you start to look at like, in addition, the great thinkers have, you know, they might have had tutors and all that stuff. I think that's a huge piece of it. But almost invariably, I mean, again, we don't know for sure, for sure. But these, a lot of these characters acted like, they had serious psychological issues. Mm. Think about like that, these psychological issues, including ADHD, they're antisocial ultimately, you know, because you're distracted, you're not present, you're not paying attention to the other person. If you have autism, same deal. If you, um, you know, if you have bipolar, if you're like any of these things that uh, pretty much everything but anxiety, social anxiety, and, and again, that is, it still is antisocial because it's not like truly getting, you know, but they, but they're socially focused in that situation, but the, everything but anxiety, you'll notice those things I named dyslexia also, and all that, this is like what the greats, the, these geniuses all had. It's like, as if like their antisocial kind of part of their life was necessary for them to learn. The key is just whether these people can be reintegrated back into society with their new ideas. I mean, look at, look at Elon Musk as a case study, right? Like he goes off and he's like, we need to go to new planets. We got to go to green energy. We got to change the way that, you know, I'm going backwards and we got to change the way that, you know, we pay people, all that stuff. And he, I mean, good ideas, right? Um, right now, for, you know, ironically, someone with, you know, on the autism spectrum is like, you know, a, a CEO, at least temporarily for a social media company gonna, and everyone is like going berserk about it. You know, I think that like, we have to take the good and, and instead we like, as you know, conventional wisdom, mainstream culture, they're focused on like this guy, he's like, ter- you know, look, he's a jackass and all that stuff. And I'm like, Okay, you know, sure, but like, what about integrating new ideas and then taking what we can and, and realizing this, that these people are like, you know, they're not, their brains are working in one way and not in another, and that's it. And just like, you know, flip side for the people who are hyper socially aware and all that. So, well, looking at, know, it's looking at society kind of like taking too. comfort in that. Yeah, but looking at society, you know, I I've, I've been saying for for years that you know, if we look at autism as one of the core social uh, um, impairments in autism is that that theory of mind, that ability to really see something from somebody else's point of view, to be able to understand that, oh, other people have different opinions and interests and and ideas. Um, and not that they're better or worse, that they're just different. And so one of the things I've been thinking for years is like our elected government, governmental bodies, like they it's like the collectively have autism because nobody is listening to each other because we're just shouting that we're right yeah right and it's like no learning is going to ever happen when we were just shouting that we're right i really appreciate that framework because i've been i think that's just like i know because people can take offense you know when you call oh you're acting autistic kind of like they're like well you don't know what it's like to have autism and all that so i understand all that but like i think that there's a level of kind of a spectrum of like behaviors that people engage in who are not autistic or not this or not that, but are just like they're playing into or like are behaving in a way that aligns with that at some level without having to be this or that. But it's like, it's kind of, it's like this behavioral stress response 
that's um you know they're they're trying <laughs> let's uh let's pause for a quick break and uh and when we come back um you know what? I'm just going to stay curious in this moment and be a learner. I don't know where we're going. We'll come back. You'll have to tune in to, uh, to find out. So we will be right back. Support for this podcast comes from Adult Study Hall, our online body doubling community at adultstudyhall.com. From our 24-7 drop-in room to our weekly guided and themed sessions, there are plenty of ways that you can get more done and not have to tackle your toughest tasks alone. Membership is only $19.99 a month and it's free to try for the first week. Your membership includes access to Adult Study Hall 24-7 or Ash 24-7, our co-working drop-in rooms open to you all day and night. Night. Then, if you would prefer a verbal check-in with a little bit more structure to stay focused on your writing or laundry or homework, decluttering, cleaning, job searching, whatever it is you might be working on, your membership will also include access to all of our themed and guided sessions that we call Adult Study Hall Plus or Ash Plus. And when you're done with this episode, I highly recommend giving episode 403 a listen. I jumped into one of the Ash Plus sessions with ADHD rewired coach Kat Hoyer and got to hear some success stories and experiences from members who were on the hunt for new jobs. It was really inspiring and I think you'll enjoy it. So what are you waiting for? Boost your productivity while maybe even having a bit of fun by joining our ADHD-friendly body doubling community built just for us at adultstudyhall.com. Working with others who just get it can really make all the difference. In fact, I'm actually recording this right now in Adult Study Hall because I was doing just about everything other than what I needed to be doing. And so when that happens, I log in to Adult Study Hall. That's adultstudyhall.com. I'm looking forward to co-working with you at adultstudyhall.com. Support for this podcast comes from our patrons over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. I want to thank all of our patrons, new and old, for supporting the work that we do. Perks for our patrons start at just $5 a month where you can get ad free episodes of this show. But if you are actually uh, worried that you will miss some updates of things that we are doing here at ADHD Rewired, we're actually trying a little experiment right now where we are putting the ads at the very end of the episode so you can listen to the episode on a drop by ads and if you still want to hear what we're doing here at ADHD Rewired stay tuned to the very end so you can get those by becoming a patron starting at just five dollars a month but if you're looking for additional support and want a taste of group coaching then consider becoming a patron at the $25 a month level and you can join me every fourth Tuesday of the month for our monthly coaching call that we do on Zoom if you can't make our monthly coaching call or it's not in the budget right now you can still get the audio recordings of our tips and tricks that we share every month when you become a patron at just 10 dollars a month to get all of the perks at $25 a month get ad free episodes or the ads at the end of the episode instead of in the middle and those recordings at $10 a month or the episodes with ads at the end for $5 a month and while ADHD rewired is free to listeners it does come with costs by becoming a patron at ADHD rewired.com slash patreon your support not only helps us stay independent and authentic to our stories it'll also help us cover things like storage hosting and editing services equipment and everything else we need to help keep this show running smoothly. Truly, your contribution, no matter the amount, goes a long way to help us continue to share our stories every week. So if it's in the cards for you right now and you decide to become a patron, thank you so much. Remember, perks start at just $5 a month and support can start at any amount that makes sense for you at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Thanks. All right, we are back with Ian Siegel. All right, so as we're talking about learning, and you know, I think one of the the through lines that we've uh, we've been discussing here is the impact of a stressed brain on learning. I think this really comes back to and, and down to that we are a nation and really a world that is not knowing how to deal with trauma and generational trauma. And I genuinely think that until we learn as a society how to deal with that, we are constantly going to be square pegs in round holes, especially when we are neurodivergent. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I don't, I don't know if you've like um, dug into polyvagal theory at all yet. Uh, 
Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, it's, it's funny. So that all this stuff was coming up on it. And so I listened to this one book. I think I picked the wrong book because I just like, I can stick with most books, even if I'm like, eh, it's all right. Because like, yeah. I'm always like curious, there's going to be a gem in this book somewhere, right? Like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get all the way to the end just I'm like, okay, I made it this far. I've got to get to the end because there's got to be something. I'm, I don't even remember what the book was, but I was like, uh, this isn't really doing anything for me. And then I haven't like, I have not yet seeked another book to learn about it, but I, but I know that there's a lot of stuff uh, that has been coming out over the last couple of years really about, about this. So do you want to speak to that? Oh, I mean, just sort of a little bit, just, I mean, the vagus nerve is, is like a, like kind of a control center for how activated you are, let's mm. say. And so like, if you're like, if you have like an, a predisposition toward ADHD and then you throw stress on top, right, then you're going to act a little bit more like that, you know, or, or you know, anxiety or whatever, it's going to just start to elevate. It's like kind of a, you know, it's like a fight or flight response and like halfway to, to, you know, get me the hell out of here or let me fight is like, you know, anxiety or ADHD or something, something that's kind of like a modern condition version of that. Part of the strategy of like kind of trying to calm yourself down is to like pay attention to how your body feels and try to like ground yourself by like, you know, cause it's like, you're, you're kind of in the clouds, like spun up. And so you're trying to find a way to come back to yourself. And in that process, you start to feel like, wow, my body doesn't feel so good, <laughs> you know, I think. And that, like, I think that our conscious reality is, like, what we perceive and what we think the world is, it's, is this is another part of polyvagal theory, is that it's kind of dictated by, like, how our body feels and our brain is picking up those signals. And, and but, but the thing is, is that it's low grade enough that you're not like, oh, oh, yeah, something hurts my side. It's, it's like some threshold stuff where it's like, you only notice that it was there when it, when it's removed. Kind of like the mess on my desk. I didn't realize how that much <laughs> it was bothering me until I clear it up. And then I'm like, oh, I could think again. Exactly, exactly. And the thing is, is that what happens with the human mind is that if, if you don't know what the cause, you project out. You're like, oh, there's something else that's wrong with the universe around me or my world around me even though it's just that you feel bad, you know, like, and you're not. And so like, you know, just like feelings are not facts, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of like the idea of like, this is where I think meditation and, and all that and kind of checking and doing body scans can be actually really helpful because you're like, wait a second, let me just make sure that it's not me. That's like making me feel this way that I'm actually intuiting something and not projecting something because the more activated you come, you, you, you get elevated. You start to just like, push out that bad feeling and assume it's something from the outside. So, I mean, imagine learning from someone else when that's happening. I mean, it's not going to happen. It's because our brain is doing what, it, what it's designed to do, and it's to make sense of the world. And if, if we don't have all the information, we're going to piece together some story to try to make sense of it. Exactly. And it's this dual survival mechanism because at some level, we don't want to be paying attention to our bodies all the time, right? Like, because like, you know, like for some sub-threshold thing, because then it's like, God, when, when can we ever like focus on what counts, you know, but beyond that, but then it just keeps on coming till it's like too late. And that's like something that I, you know, I, I heard in one of your podcasts about like kind of like sleep and all that. It's like really catching yourself before like you really are really tired and start and start making really bad decisions and start falling into like those because same, same things, you know, lack of sleep, that's going to put, you know, press the stress button and all that too. It's that, like I said, kind of from the beginning, it's that self-care, that kind of self-awareness. And, and and without those, you're really kind of not in, you're in kind of, you're in deep water. It's really tough to figure it out from there. When you're working with students, how much of your time is actually spent working on emotional self-regulation? I mean, I would say like with the brilliant kids, like half the time, I'm like, I'm like asking these questions that are like more like getting at the heart of like what they're scared of, you know? And, and yeah, I mean, it's because it, it's like you get them in the right place. It's like a nudge. Then they're there. It's not about me with some fancy ass explanation. If I have that, they're not remembering shit, you know, because it's too easy. They need to work for it. You know, you know, this as a coach and all that, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's just the nudge, but the nudge only half works if they're in the right state in the first place. So it's like, let's get them in the right state. And here's the nudge. Okay. Like, cause I barely have to talk when it comes to the cause. I'm like, well, bleh. I like I even like, even begin to some, say something and this kid's like, oh, yeah, 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 blah, 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 blah. And they don't want me to talk. Definitely not. Hmm. 
you know, and the reason I asked this, uh, that, that question is no matter how old you are, if you're looking at, at something in, uh, in your life and you're like, I don't know how to do this. I keep trying to do like, take a step back from the actual thing you're trying to learn and take a step inward and really look at and feel what you're feeling. And over the last probably five or 10 years, emotional self-regulation has been much more of the, the understanding of ADHD um, than it had been, uh, even though it was, you know, early on in, in, in the early days when we called it ADD, um, you know, emotional self-regulation was actually part of the diagnostic criteria. But when they, when, you know, the social sciences were trying to, you know, um, prove themselves as a, as a real science, well, emotion's hard to measure. So let's just get rid of that as one, one of the criteria. Um, but it's been there the whole time. And, you know, I, thank you. Thank you. I, I wasn't that deep with it, but I, I always, I always say this like mistakenly. I'm like the most important learning disabilities that we need to pay attention to are emotional issues. And then I include ADHD as one of them, but I'm like, oh wait, does other people don't really think that, but like, that's what I think. That's my experience of it. That's what you're pressing a stress button that causes, I mean, in the whole escape artist mentality that can kind of come out of it, which is just like, you know, like, like it, it's kind of like, being brilliant at the last minute or something like that. It kind of like, like be like kind of being special in your own way and it's the escape artist thing because you're not going to do the kind of control freak, like do it everything by the book and show how you're doing it the right way from the book way. And then it's just like, you embrace that, hold on to it so tightly, but it's like, no, nah, you gotta let that go, you know, cause it's, it's, it's holding you back from learning at what you, what you, at the pace you really could. But I think like overall, like, I think just accepting that if ADHD is part of it, embrace when you're feeling that way. And maybe that's, that's that antisocial moment where you're going to learn something away from the crowd. So instead of beating yourself up on top of feeling like you're distracted, which even, which ratchets up your stress even more, be like, Oh yeah, this is part of my play. You know, this is what my life is. This is what it's about. And I'm going to have some kind of unique insight that other people don't have. And that's it. You know, and it's, it's a little bit of a struggle. It sucks. But something's good going to come out of it, basically. And having that confidence, I think, is a, it's a, that can really help you kind of like ratchet it down and also like, you know, entertain these cool ideas and bring them back to, mm -hmm. to the mainstream of society. Ian Siegel, the website is Ian, I A N Siegel, S I E G E L dot com. We will put a link to that in the, uh, this episode's show notes. Uh, check out the book, uh, School Sucks, Your Child Doesn't. Can we get t-shirts with that made too? Because that's just an amazing title. Um, You'll be the first one to get one. Oh man, that's that's great. No, I, I love that. Any final thoughts uh, or any other places that, that um, you would like uh, listeners to reach you at? No, I think that's it. Just you can check me out there. Check out the book on Amazon. And um, if you want to learn more about your child unlocking their brilliance, I'll be the person to talk to. So check us out at streamlinelearning.com in that case. Thanks so much. Ian, yeah, thanks for learning with us. Eric, thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons and join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. 
you can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keep Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15 minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.